Welcome to today's webinar, Unified Collaboration for a Connected Enterprise with Collective Spaces. My name is Jeff, and I will be your host. Your speakers today are Chip Gettinger, SDL VP Global Solutions, and Joe Perriman, SDL Senior Product Manager. We expect today's webinar will last about 30 to 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you have any questions, then please enter them in the Q&A box. I will now pass you over to Joe to begin the presentation. That's great. Thank you, Jeffrey. So just a quick look at the agenda. Um, so we're going to dip into some recent highlights of product releases, and then we're really going to major on this whole collective spaces, uh, as the title of this webinar indicated. Uh, so I'll go a bit through the, the background for this, why it's needed, who it's for, etc. And then Chip will do an extended demo on, on this new functionality. We then come back to me. I will go through an update on plans for security and architecture at a high level, um, and then look out to some more kind of visionary aspects of what we're doing with the product roadmap. And close out with uh, not only kind of concrete release plans, uh, but a look into what we're doing to uh, improve reporting, particularly on reuse analysis of content in Tridian Docs. All right, but first of all, wanted to go through some recent highlights and chip. Would you mind talking over this? Sure. Hi, Joe. Good day, everybody. Nice to see everyone joining us. Uh, and some recent customers we've had at SDL for Treaty and Docs have been two customers in China, United Imaging and Leap Motor, two uh, major customers for us in China. And here in the States, we have a new customer, Zimmer Bionet, which is really an interesting application for something called Connected Health. Uh, Zimmer is in the business of making uh, uh, a knee replacement, joint replacements. And they built this very sophisticated online application uh, for you to work with on your iWatch when you're pre and post surgery. And they're using SCL Tridian to drive a lot of that content. So very exciting type application. So back to you, Joe. Thank you, Chip. Um, a couple of other things to mention, um, just kind of a little bit of a, well, maybe it sounds like patting ourselves on the back, but uh, I'm sure anyone who works in software knows uh, release timelines can be can be uh, tricky things. And we're very happy that we managed to get Trillion Docs 14 out uh, slightly earlier than we thought internally. Uh, so that was uh, technical availability early July this year. With uh, Draft Space, uh, which is one of the big new environments within Collective Spaces, which we're going to have a look at in a minute, um, and which we're extending with the very shortly upcoming, should be kind of this week or next week, uh, technical availability of Tridian Docs 14 SP1. And just another thing I thought was worth mentioning was um, kind of. Uh, Analysts kind of affirmation really uh, that we're doing a good job and we're going in absolutely the right direction. Uh, so the recent Ars Logical report on CCMSs has us right at the top right of this diagram as market leaders um, and very much kind of hitting the spot in ability to live to deliver as well as uh, being forward looking. So very nice to get that affirmation from from Ars Logica. Now, Chip. I think you were going to talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of uh, trends in, in delivery. Sure, Joe. Thanks. So really, this, this kind of next generation uh, customer experience we're seeing with many of our customers and prospects looking at, uh, at really SEL, and it, it centers around an area we're now calling knowledge hubs. Uh, many of you in the audience have presented your content on the web. Uh, many of you successfully moved away from PDFs, but perhaps your current presentation might be more traditional tripane uh, type of a display. Really what we're seeing with knowledge hubs is this kind of one-stop shop where information uh, is actually shared 
from several different applications. And, and it really does become a center that uh, employees or customers, partners can come to find information. Um, one customer's California Casualty, we did a case study on just recently uh, and saw a dramatic improvement because they were able to dramatically um, consolidate their content onto a single knowledge hub. So Joe, I think you have some more insights too as the way STL supports this. Sure. So I think a key dif differentiator here in how we do it um, is the fact that this is built on an enterprise uh, web CMS kind of platform for content delivery. Um, so clearly, you know, people have various options. Sometimes they'll kind of do their own delivery. Uh, little portal or whatever, but I think we bring a whole different level of kind of support and security around that with a whole dynamic delivery, DXD as we call it, um, delivery platform. So that's something that we do and uh, people are making very good use of now. Um, not sure how many customer names we're allowed to mention, Chip, but uh, uh, we've seen some really kind of inspiring cases of, of this being used. It is. It is, Joe. And and if you're interested, if you go to SEL.com slash connect at our recent connect conference in California, all the most of the sessions are recorded. And there are a few customer sessions that talk about this, Joe, if anyone in the audience was interested. That's great. Sounds good. Thanks, Chip. Uh, but clearly, you know, um, we cannot just stay where we are. Um, and one of the things that we want to uh, enhance in our delivery capabilities um, is provide more out of the box capabilities to do kind of advanced delivery. So beyond the simple portals, um, we already have, of course, the content mashups scenario where you're bringing in um, web content. So from Trillion Sites together with Trillion Docs, as in this screenshot here. Uh, so you've got your kind of mock-ums at the top, you've got your technical data in the middle, you've got links to other content. And that's very much possible right now um, to enable an integrated knowledge portal. But we want to extend this. Uh, we certainly want to improve further the way that we work with external content libraries, such as video libraries and so on. Uh, it could even be legacy PDF libraries that we want to index and show uh, right in the same unified search. Uh, we also want to develop capability around uh, kind of sharing and bookmarking, if you like, around collections of content. Um, and then something that uh, really ties in with a general kind of strategic product direction across Tridian um, is working on findability and linking within the context of kind of taxonomy driven or semantic technology driven um, capabilities. So, so this is things like faceted search, of course, uh, synonym based search. But also using this intelligence that's baked into the content to make proactive kind of recommendations about what people should see. And just a quick case, I mean, it's it's easy to kind of always focus on the little snippet of content that gives you exactly the right answer. It's kind of you like you want to know the weather, you want to know a piece of data or whatever, you Google it and it's right there. But an equally important use case uh, for Tridian Docs, as for Google, which they recognize, um, is the kind of the more exploratory kind of piecing together different bits of information in order to make a decision. Um, I mean, if you take a classic kind of customer example where, um, you know, we've got manufacturers using Tridian Docs and their field service engineers need to install a machine. And it's not like you kind of just read the steps in a short topic one to five, right? Great, you've installed your machine. There's clearly a little bit more pre-planning and, and thought to go into it. What kind of environment do you have available? Um, all the diff different considerations around how you want to use that machine and so on. So that necessarily means you're gonna be stitching together different pieces of content whether it's different uh, kind of uh, topics from docs. Um, it could very much be video links, it could be other web content, it could be external content. So all of this needs to be linked together. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that we want to drive with kind of personalized recommendations and linking as well. So that's the way forward for our, for our knowledge hub delivery capabilities. But just stepping back a bit, I want to look at some features that we've uh, that we've got in recent Tridian Docs releases. Um, so I just showed the content mashups capability, which is clearly showing on the same the same pages, uh, Tridian Sites content and Tridian Docs, um, and doing it in a clever kind of a way. 
So it's not just kind of putting in hard links that says this topic in docs must always link to this given piece of site's content because such things are very fragile. What if somebody updates it and the link breaks? What if it goes away? What if there are actually two relevant bits of site's content to show on the page now? Um, so because we do this through taxonomy effectively, um, then you have the flexibility to always show what's relevant and available rather than relying on these fragile kind of hard links. So that was at least last year to my memory um, that we released the content mashups. Uh, we had big, big improvements in Tridian Docs 13 also on publishing speed, uh, where we got publishing up to 50% faster, um, particularly for large documents. We've also streamlined the content import process. Um, so two cases for this. One is that you are uh, importing kind of source language content, um, and it could either be during a migration. Let's say another team in your organization is um, wants to get on board and use Tridian Docs, and they want to import some legacy content. Um, so you get it in a data type shape, and you can import it. Um, uh, or it could be actually external content that you're ingesting on a regular basis. So those are one broad use case, so the source language. And then, of course, importing translations as well. Um, so we've made improvements to doing both of those through the new content importer tool, um, which has a very nice UX. You can do things like pause and resume easily. Performance is pretty good, and it's, it's working very nicely. Um, Clearly along the way, productivity enhancements for technical authors, uh, too many to mention, I would say, but um, things like, uh, and you might think it's an obvious one, but uh, the ability to search for other publications when you are in Publication Manager, um, which is now there. So a gap that's been filled and other ones have been done and others are on the way. And then finally, um, this new uh, subject matter uh, expert authoring environment, Draft Space which we're going to dip into now. So in the presentations I was doing last year, um, particularly STL Connect conference for anyone who was there, I was talking about the traditional uh, docs workflow where things were a bit siloed, things were a bit kind of restricted and technical authors basically had all the power and a lot of the kind of responsibility. Um, so you had to be quite a highly trained technical author to really make sense of working in Ditter XML, um, to put in all these con refs, understand what was going on with variables and so on and so on. Even just the topics and maps things it needs some kind of background, particularly when you add in version, version control into that. And so typically, you had your subject matter experts contributing content. Of course, you need to get your engineers, um, product experts, or it could be uh, in the case where content is the product. Um, it could be health information, it could be legal information. Whatever your content is, you often want to get your experts uh, contributing it directly rather than via Word. But the traditional kind of interfaces for them to do so into Ditter have been pretty restricted. So almost a form filling kind of environment, or at least splitting it out into small chunks of text, a topic at a time, which doesn't give them much control or much context as to where it's going. And there has been this sense that you're kind of dropping your text into a black box, and then you're never quite sure what, what happens to it as an SME. So that's how it was. Similarly, when you get either kind of SMEs or other other specialized teams around the organization involved in reviewing, it could be legal teams, uh, it could be an, other product experts, could be general kind of management, um, then that's been limited as well, this reviewing process. So typically, you might have everything very, very nicely structured in docs. And then you would tend to output Word or a PDF, send that around. Um, and then from that one document that you send around, you get back kind of 20 copies, all with kind of conflicting comments. Maybe the formatting's changed as well. And you have to, as an author, kind of consolidate all of that back, which is not only a pain and, and you know, means you lose productivity, um, but on a more serious note, from a kind of a compliance and regu regulatory perspective, where you seriously have to show how you're dealing with each piece of feedback, then this is risky because you can lose things. And people often end up with kind of very laborious manual processes to record every single comment in a row in Excel. 
laptops are not much fun. And I'm not saying that, you know, nobody has tried to do online centralized ways of, of doing this. Clearly, we have ourselves in the past. And I, would, I think it's fair comment to say that across the board, the, the online ways of doing this so far have been somewhat buggy and, and somewhat unscalable, whether in terms of the usability or the, or the actual kind of technical capability, uh, technical sca scalability as such. So we really see a new world emerging, new kind of demands which we're having to meet in the product. Um, and this is why, first of all, we came out with draft space. And Chip's going to show this, so I'm not going to kind of talk too much about this, but draft space, an environment where you really give subject matter experts, um, non-technical authors, but experts in their fields, some real control over the content and some ability to input in a more contextual and much easier way in a familiar, almost word style environment. So that's one thing. That doesn't mean that you don't anymore need some professional authors helping to wrangle the content, check the versions, get it through the workflow, translate everything and so on and so on. So Publication Manager and the, the other thick client tools are still very relevant for this kind of curating and uh, governance type activity. So still in the picture. And then the third piece, though, and this is what's coming out in the uh, upcoming SP1. As I say, it's a matter of days now. Um, and this is review space, uh, which is an environment for very easily, with very little training, um, anyone around the organization um, contributing to reviews, suggesting changes, um, and interacting on the workflow there. And it's all centralized and, and reportable. So that's the new kind of landscape there. And just dipping into this a little bit, screenshot of draft space, but again, Chip will show you this in a second and the various good things. But just to say, it is this word style interface. You have a, an outline view um, and you can move things around in the outline and you can very smoothly scroll through even kind of massive documents, even kind of semiconductor documentation, kind of hundreds and thousands of pages. Uh, you can just scroll through and it will keep on loading the topics as needed. So that's draft space. Um, and correspondingly, here's, here's review space. Same kind of rendering, same kind of smooth usability. Uh, the difference being that you're not expected to directly edit the content, but feedback on it here. And so you have this comments and annotations panel, which shows, by the way, also in draft space. So it's a kind of interactive experience between authors and reviewers. Um, and it all gets stored in this centralized location. So a little bit more about review space. Very scalable. Uh, we've designed it this way. Um, it really can scale up to hundreds and hundreds of reviewers. Um, requires very little training, actually, to be honest, about an hour, and most people would be good to go. And, and most of that would be more on the concept that you have um, a publication and it has things called topics um, and that you need to know the these sheets, if you like, or these blocks that you're looking at. They are topics. They're independent files. That's pretty much it then you're good to go, then you're good to start commenting. Very much integrated with draft space, draft space singular. Sorry, my technical writer background coming out there, but should have missed off that last S. Um, and then it has a full API um, so that you can really check on the compliance, you can get reports out of it, um, and you can make sure that everybody is following the process. Or if you're challenged later on, if you have to produce kind of accounts of what, you know, what feedback there was and how you dealt with it, then again, you can get that out at a later date. OK, so I believe Chip is going to demo this very soon. Um, and just to say overall, it is this sense of a connected workflow um, between reviewers and authors there. They both seem to see the same comments, the same kind of resolutions to feedback, um, and so on. Well, great, Joe. Thanks for that introduction and setup. Do you see my demo on the live screen yet? I see it. Great, great. So, Joe, thanks for setting me up well. Um, so really what I wanted to focus on for a demo this today is around subject matter experts and as Joe talked about in collaboration and working together in a unified platform. Um, so what I'd like to do is start from an email. 
Um, many of you work in organizations where you may have marketers, uh, product managers, engineers who need to review uh, comment or content online. And so what this scenario is, I work for a company called, uh, and we have a new product called X Design, and we're doing a sales guide update. And so um, uh, I'm going to be the first role is playing Rachel. And in this particular role, Rachel gets an email from Chip saying that it's time to go ahead and uh, review. So I'm going to log in as Rachel. So now I'm being authenticated. So the first thing you notice is you do need to be a named user, known user of the system, but we can use single sign-on that you may have in place already today within your Trity and Docs system. So the first thing I notice is, is in this review space interface, and this is the part that's brand new, that's coming out in the service pack one in a, in, in a matter of days, as Joe mentioned. Uh, and what I really like is there's this kind of shared dashboard on the right-hand side of all the comments that are coming in. And I'm gonna go over the various types of comments that I have within the system. So couple of things, one of the things you'll notice is that uh, with draft space and review space, we've now added in the ability to track the reasons for comments and resolution. This is some feedback that SCL got from our customers, you guys, around um, the metadata of tracking this information, of uh, the fact that uh, this particular uh, 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 comment was resolved and I can see the reason why it was it was resolved and so forth and as Joe mentioned this is our out-of-the-box experience but our APIs also allow us to reach in and do reporting on this as Joe mentioned earlier now probably a little bit more uh, relevant is that uh, there's some comments down here from uh, Nigel, and I can see, for example, I can click on this and I can see, ah, okay, are these, are these numbers still valid? And I can see the actual uh, attachment to the information he has. And I'm the expert and I can go, yes, these are still valid. And I can still type as well. So I can reply to Nigel and then he would see my comment and reply back to him immediately. And you can see the metadata around that and so forth. So um, some more interesting kind of information is how would I like to come and maybe add in my own comment? So for example, I can see uh, scrolling down here, ah, there's an acronym that I don't like. So by double clicking on the content in the review space window, I have the ability to add a suggestion or add a comment. And I'm gonna add a suggestion, which allows me to say, okay, I'm going to change this from HW to hardware. And the reason is, um, you know, better understanding for the audience. Great, uh, make a quick change there. And then the other thing you'll notice is I can say what type of particular comment that I have. And then once I click on save, this comment is now stored and it has the ability to uh, have other people come in and reply. And I'll talk about that in a minute. A couple of other quick things is you notice I can go back and edit this comment either myself or a power user, the admin can make that change. I can also delete the comment and that's a privilege only to me right now. The other thing you'll notice is this comment is unshared. So right now it's private. In a moment, I'm gonna share my comments that I have that I need to make uh, public for other people to uh, be able to resolve and look at them and so forth. Um, a couple of other things are the fact that um, I would like to uh, let's say, uh, come in and if I do a particular comment, you'll notice that I can say, you know, spell this out and I can save it. So a comment just does the general comment and so forth as we have and going forward. So uh, the last thing I'd like to do is before I kind of change roles here is I'm going to share my comments. 
So as I mentioned, these are the comments that I've just created in this in this short uh, spin here. And uh, by basically clicking on my share button now, my comments are now public for users to see and work on in the system. So this has been Review Space, and uh, Review Space really does have the simplified user interface for review. Um, one other last thing you'll notice is as a reviewer, I can actually see the workflow statuses. Uh, for you, uh, for any longtime Tridian Docs users, you know these are the workflow statuses that are configured into your system. So Collective Spaces does pick up on the existing metadata that you have. And in fact, I can see this topic here, pain points is released, and we'll come back to that. If I have the privilege, for example, notice I can't change from draft because of my work, uh, my particular status um, as a user, my user role. But if I come down to, to be reviewed, I do have the ability to move it into another workflow status. So probably the last important thing is as Rachel here, uh, it's, it's obeying uh, and following all the uh, basic uh, privileges that you've set up within your Treaty and Docs system. So let's switch gears here for a minute. I'm going to switch now to a different user, Nigel. And Nigel is a author, a subject matter uh, author. And uh, Nigel actually now is going to be using Review Space. And, and what I'm doing is earlier, Rachel was using Firefox and, and now um, as Nigel, I'm gonna use Chrome and I'm just gonna go to full screen to have a little bit more real estate here. Uh, but one of the major differences now is you see Nigel sees the same document that Rachel was working on. Now, one thing I wanted to now go into a little bit more detail is one of the big changes with Collective Spaces is we're working at the whole publication or document level. So for those of you familiar again with Tradian Docs and the publication level, both Nigel and Rachel and others are working at a publication level. The other thing you'll notice is that there's feedback now for Nigel, again, as an SME author, to see, for example, pain points is released. Now, Nigel does have the privilege in his particular user role to create the new version, the next version of this particular pain point. We'll come back to that later. Another area is I can see that uh, Michael Davis right now is editing this topic. So it's locked, even though it's in a draft status, but I can see it's grayed out. Um, so uh, very, very nice feedback that I get in the particular user role. Now, a couple of other things is that, um, as Joe mentioned, uh, Collective Spaces is designed to work with very large publications. Uh, if I go into what I call my outline view, I can actually see, for example, I can, if I wanna quickly go down to weaknesses, what you'll notice is, is that this is our lazy loading. And what lazy loading has doing is, is essentially loading the topics um, or documents as we call them, as I scroll through the particular publication. This is a really ingenious design to basically we build as this, of course, uh, a standard web browser kind of technology but we're able to support very, very large publications by utilizing the lazy loading. And it's all really transparent to an author because I have the ability to go through and scroll and work in content as I see fit. So let's switch back now and start working again in some of the comments that we saw earlier with Rachel. So you'll notice I have a comments tab directly in draft space. And now in draft space, I have the ability to come in here and see some actual changes here. And so for example, I can say, oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. This really should be, um, I'm just gonna move up here and change this to 6 billion. So immediately, what just happened behind the scenes is this topic got checked out to me, but that's pretty transparent to Nigel as an SME. He doesn't have to right click, check out, open up his authoring tool. It's very intuitive and interactive here. And Nigel can come up and say, um, great, I've fixed this. 
and he can reply and then he can mark this as resolved and he can say that I'm going to go ahead and apply that change and so forth and uh, and then say that it's done and so forth. Whoops. And I can say that it's fixed. So and you notice right there that I have to put in um, a mandatory field and so forth. So um, now it gets really interesting. Some other comments that we have is what we do in editorial suggestion. Um, as you saw uh, earlier, I have the ability to do attract changes, and and this is going to be extended with uh, in in early uh, in mid 2020. Joe's going to talk about it in a bit, but this track changes actually allows me to take content and say. And earlier, you saw me do it as HW to hardware. Is I would actually like to resolve this particular content. So what I can do is I'm just going to um, oops hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and resolve this particular content. So what I can do is, is I can say, yes, I will update this content right now. So Chip has gone through and made some changes and so forth. And I'm going to go ahead and say I'm going to apply those. And, and then I can actually click on done. And I'm going to simply go up here into my text of my content and uh, paste in the new changes that have been uh, suggested by that particular SME. So this is an important feature. Many of our customers have told us track changes are important. We also know that track changes vary across the different authoring tools, which has been a challenge. So with Collective Spaces, SDL's taken a very innovative approach in the way that we do our commenting and suggest the content and so forth. So, um, so that is one of the areas that I think is new with the service pack one that's coming out in a matter of days, Trading Docs 14. Um, let me kind of go back here. I'm going to revert back now to the full document view. I want to go back and work on um, the entire document and as a whole. So obviously earlier you saw me make changes in this content. If I come in here and I hit on enter, what you'll notice is, is that this document industry trends and challenges has been unlocked for me to come in and do editing. So I can come in here, add in particular information and so forth. Now, there's some other things that I can do as well that are more advanced out of capabilities. And the nice part that Joe had mentioned earlier, this is very intuitive type of interface is the other actions I need to do is that there was a comment back here that um, I needed to come in and add in a particular, um, uh, here it is, um, I'm going to add in a particular footnote right here. So if I come in here and I highlight this particular area here and I go to structure, uh, add in a footnote, I can then add in a footnote and say values from the vendor. And then that particular footnote is changed. And then I can actually resolve that particular comment and say done and so forth. So the idea is with draft space, I can actually go and resolve the comments and annotations that my reviewers have added me and changed me or actually doing is I'm actually making the live changes in the content itself in real time. So a couple of last things that I think are important and we'll do a little bit more advanced editing. And then Joe, I'd love to hear from you anything that I missed here. So um, let's go and look at this outline view. So one of the other benefits that we know is content reuse. And uh, Draft space allows me to come in and say that I would like to actually add in a topic around uh, different trends that are coming in. So this is actually my folders of my repository. So I have the ability to come in and look at particular uh, new trends in the market. 
I see a preview of it here and I can go, great, this is the particular um, topic that I would like to actually add in into my outline view. So several things have happened. One is, is you see the structure is added in, the new trends in market. You'll also see that I have this information right here and I can say in here in the, and I'm gonna add in in the 2020 market. And again, you see that now I can start editing this information. And then I have the ability of, for example, coming in and let's say, let's change this into um, a particular notice and so forth. So draft space also allows me to do a lot of the formatting and so forth in a very intuitive type of interface. One of the other things I really like is the ability for draft space to have uh, kind of these ellipses come up and show that, oh, gee, I wanted to change this to another type of note. This is really important, again, for SMEs that may not know all the tagging that you're working on and so forth. What's really nice about the interface is that we do show the tagging or the structure down below here in the breadcrumbs. And as I hover over the items, and there's actually some shortcuts here as well for authors. So just depending on the comfort level, how people want to go through and change things. And of course, there's also right click and the ability to do that and so forth. So obviously I've been doing a lot of work here and you can actually see that I've made changes and so forth. So one of the last actions I can do is I have the ability to come in and change some workflow statuses. So for example, um, I'm going to go ahead and save this particular content here. And, uh, and then I have the ability to actually change this into a to be reviewed status. So that changes the workflow for someone to be notified to go ahead and review that particular content. Um, for the advanced users, we actually also show the trading and docs uh, properties that you may be familiar with. And so I can actually see who the author is. New with draft space is we have the ability to hide certain fields. So I have the ability to see other uh, fields and uh, for traditional customers, many of you notice these are the same values that um, you have in uh, Publication Manager and the authoring tool. Um, earlier, Joe was also talking about taxonomies and uh, draft space allows me to enter in uh, information uh, in external taxonomy systems as well. But Joe, I wanna be conscious of time and uh, hand the reins back to you. Uh, any other points? I think one other thing, Joe, you wanted to mention a little bit about uh, authoring uh, for Japanese and Chinese and uh, double byte languages. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chip. Good reminder. So just to say that um, <clears throat> we support in draft space input method editors, which is basically the kind of the on-screen on interface uh, for entering in. Indeed, it's commonly for East Asian languages, but it equally works for things like emoji if you need those in your content and so on. So they just work very smoothly as if you were just entering entering them in Word or any other application. So good point. And I think the only other thing to mention from a technical point of view, not that most users should have to care about this, um, but the astute people will have noticed that we're, we're taking a deliberate kind of technical stance on this. Um, so it's this decoupled kind of an approach um, where we have the annotations, the feedback and comments stored separately from the content itself, which is a little bit different from the way that, um, uh, you know, other software has, has tended to do it. And it's a deliberate decision because it's only really in this way that you get the true scalability um, that you get to be independent of object versions and so on. You don't get kind of um, lock conflicts and all of this kind of stuff, or just a huge kind of mess with everybody's different comments going into the source XML. So this is a way to make it truly scalable and, and stable. Uh, but as I say, most people shouldn't even have to be care, uh, to care about the way it's implemented. So just moving forward, um, Another key, well, optional piece, it is optional functionality in collective spaces, but we think it will be useful to a number of uh, organizations, um, is the upcoming document history. So that's not in this SP1 release. Um, that's in a release in uh, kind of late spring next year, late spring 2020. 
Um, so there's optional kind of mode within draft space so that authors working on content can see who changed what and when. Um, and that's all across the current topic version. So getting a very good view on, on what's actually been changing in the content. Um, and so, by the way, can everybody see my screen at the moment? Chip, are you seeing this? Looks great, Joe. You can see the slide. Okay, that's good. Um, bit of a new interface here, but uh, good that everyone can see it. Um, so you can see it's this very granular kind of information. It's not only a kind of a rend line what changed, but exactly when did it change? And the, the way it's doing this is by um, comparing all the different revisions um, since the start of the topic version, and even who, uh, who checked them in and so on, um, and getting all that data out here um, as this this granular information, and it does enable you. So here it's a read-only mode on the to see these changes, but then you can drop straight back into the editing mode at any point of these um, of these changes and edit further there. So that's document history, and for a broad timeline on this functionality, just to sum up, and I think the slides will be available after the after the webinar as well. Um, so clearly, draft space was in July. Um, as I say, in a matter of days, SP1 with review space, all the features that Chip's just talked about, and then SP2 late spring 2020 uh, with document history, as we said, this optional paid add-on, which will let authors get really kind of deep insight into what changed and when. So in the remaining few minutes, I just wanted to dip into a few areas, um, other kind of roadmap areas we'll be focusing on over the next kind of 18 months to two years. Uh, first of all, the kind of less visually appealing, but still absolutely critical area of security and architecture. So some hints here, and I have bundled in also translation connectivity here. Um, so in-country review, um, so again, as of that uh, Docs 14 SP2 release, um, we'll be having the ability to also in review space, look at target language translations that have come back from your translators. And if you just want to comment on the actual way it's been translated. So not a comment on source content, but more on the translation itself. And this is strictly within review space at this point, not, not in draft space, uh, but this is important functionality for a number of organizations. And then of course, support for, for language cloud as well as is coming in during the next year. Um, so very important that we're uh, working well with the wider ecosystem of, of uh, STL products, of course. Um, then a big piece, um, and it's what, well, in, this is a really internal name, this web client 2.0. Basically, when we're talking about the web client, it is this browser-based interface where you do uh, things like work with folders, um, work with translations, and if you're an admin, you know, you can uh, tweak the statuses and all of those good things. So it's this interface where we really need to do some kind of uh, reworking of the plumbing, if you like, Remo removing older bits of code. Uh, basing on a much more modern architecture, um, which is helping us. Uh, it will use a new internal API, which is a stepping stone to a new public API. Uh, it's making upgrades easier indirectly. Um, it's making the whole cloud experience easier. Uh, so just a massive improvement overall. So it will be noticeable, just not necessarily in terms of uh, uh, kind of flashy features, except that, of course, um, being the new web client, doing it all from scratch, we'll be basing on the new uh, unified uh, UX uh, across SDL. Um, and uh, so that's, that's going to be a nice visual refresh as well. And then further things, so the web client itself helps with these kind of upgrade friendly features. Um, and we were doing uh, further consolidation of things like the, the configuration files. We've already made progress on that. There are fewer and fewer conf config files to worry about when you upgrade um, and consolidating those more. And things like also making the client tools easier to deploy and upgrade. So that's a quick dip into that um, critical kind of uh, direction that we will be going, um, starting to emerge around kind of end of next year, uh, beginning of 21, and then very much kind of picking up pace after that, what you might call semantic AI. Um, it's really uh, a sense of uh, 
STL High here. Um, so this kind of whole AI capability that we have that we are now bringing to bear on structured content. So one of the key use cases around here um, is Tridian Docs as enabling this kind of knowledge hub that we've seen, where it's not only about unifying everything that you're delivering, so whether it's from Tridian Sites, Tridian Docs, external content, et cetera, et cetera. It's also the broader view of what should a knowledge hub be. Um, and it's the systems that are feeding content into Tridian Docs in the first place, be that product information, um, be that other ways of drafting content and so on. Whatever data is coming in, and also whatever different kind of channels you have consuming the content on the way out. So this is all part of this kind of knowledge hub story. Um, so really making a, a cross enterprise kind of knowledge creation system. Um, and so this is definitely the vision. Clearly, Trillion Docs is also very uh, is already very integratable, um, but improving on this connectivity. And whenever you do this. Whenever you're stitching different systems together, you know, we might be talking to a, a chat bot or something. Uh, we might be talking to product information management system. And you run the risk that it's kind of an ad hoc point to point integration, which kind of somehow lacks context and insight in that you can kind of pump the raw data or the content between these systems. But it doesn't come with very much sense of who created it, how and when, who's it applicable, what what does it actually mean, um, and, and who should we be targeting this to, and so on. So lots of potential for gaps, for redundant uh, content creation processes, even for poor governance if, if content is not kind of rooted to the correct people um, because there's too much kind of manual work going on. So somehow there is this need for a, a connecting fabric, really, across the whole of this knowledge hub. And that goes beyond just Trillion Docs as we know it now um, to a kind of broader view on the ecosystem. And that's when we look at semantic technology, um, which has been working on this for a while. And you see this in certain knowledge management use cases and so on, but um, really kind of uh, bringing this to the world of structured concept management now. Uh, where you explicitly, in, in a metadata layer, a semantic metadata layer, um, then uh, you are mapping all of the kind of entities that you're talking about, the content objects, the things that they are describing in the real world, and understanding those relationships between each other. Um, and this is critically important because, after all, people do want to improve their productivity through AI. Um, but if you do that in a kind of a uh, an indiscriminate way to say, well, you know, this will be this magic kind of box that just makes decisions for you. You know, it's, it can auto tag everything, perhaps, or it can route it to the right place without human input. Um, as I think we all recognize now, uh, sometimes that can go wrong. And ultimately, it's hard to explain those decisions. And as the whole kind of regulatory environment gets stricter and we're working either with explicitly regulated organizations or people who just care about the way that think these things done, it becomes much more important to be able to explain these decisions that are made. And you can do that through the whole semantic technology kind of process. So this is the vision. I would invite you to have a look at the, the slides when they come out. Um, but really, this connective vision I've been talking about, whether you're connecting to various external systems in terms of input or consumption channels and delivery, uh, all making use of this smart metadata layer. And uh, encourage people to read up on, uh, on semantic technology in general. Just to say that the way that this does things um, is through a system of kind of truly globally unique IDs. So every system knows what it's talking about in a uh, very unambiguous way. Um, and that's relationships between objects and the things that they mean. And this is this case where it, if you deal with taxonomy in a semantic sense, you can reuse a public taxonomy. Um, here's a bit of a big kind of uh, health related taxonomy here, for example. And many of our customers uh, are required to use public taxonomies. So you can easily ingest them. You can apply them to content. And when you publish content out, everybody still knows um, that you are using this public taxonomy and, the, and what it means, not just by matching strings or labels, but by these uh, IDs. 
So plenty more that could be said about this, and I'm sure we'll go into more depth in the upcoming sessions. But I just wanted to point out finally, um, how do we make this kind of usable? It's all very well talking about this kind of high powered technology, but how do we bring it back to the actual human users of the system? Um, and here's an example where hopefully now I have a video that will play. So you can imagine that this is a snippet of a very large taxonomy. I'm gonna shift domains now and we're going to a financial taxonomy, but typically these public taxonomies are big beasts and it's a bit much to expect your authors, particularly your SME authors, to kind of scroll through massive trees of taxonomy and kind of pick the right thing. So we need to get a bit smarter. And this is what this video should hopefully do. So this is a design preview of something that we're actually working on in terms of tagging suggestions. So we have a piece of content now about a financial tool and we're automatically mapping things from a big public taxonomy to say, well, we think these concepts of the taxonomy are actually relevant here. And it is a bit smarter than just kind of string matching, I would say. Um, seem to have lost the view, but it's fine. I can still talk about it. Uh, it's a bit smarter than just matching tags by the strings themselves. It's using some kind of deeper insight into the meaning of the content um, and looking at the relationships contained in the taxonomy to pick out, for example, synonyms and suggest the correct concept from the taxonomy, or even things that aren't mentioned at all in the text but seem to be relevant and related. So allowing authors to very easily pick from that selection of tags, pick the right ones, uh, don't pick the wrong ones. Essential again to have that human kind of decision making process uh, finally. And that's what makes it all kind of explainable at the end of the day. Um, and a really easy process to get, bake that intelligence into the content to start off with. That's a little preview into semantics. Very quickly, um, something quite related, but a lot of people have, have been asking for uh, kind of better reporting, particularly in terms of uh, reuse. So Tridian Docs clearly massively improves productivity and accuracy through content reuse. And people want to get metrics on this, which is absolutely fair. And this is a challenge, I would say, across the whole kind of structured content and certainly Ditter kind of world that many people want this and uh, nobody has really got a, a great way of doing so. So we've been running this kind of internal proof of concepts uh, to try and work this out. And this was really inspired by customer feedback on the community ideas board, um, which is a great resource, strongly encourage people to use it. We are watching it, even if we're not always as responsive publicly as we should be, which we'll get better. Um, but we very much read all the feedback on, on the ideas board. And this was feedback to say, yeah, we, we need these reuse metrics out of the system. So quick proof of concepts. I'm not going to go into massive detail about how we got there. It was very much kind of cobbling things together with bits of duct tape and so on, uh, but just to prove the point. And here we're looking at reuse and we're getting some metrics on the effort it would take if you weren't reusing content um, compared to the efforts that you're actually spending because you are reusing content. Here it's a very naive kind of way. We're only taking the first version of each publication um, and so on. But it's just a view to say, yes, that data is in there and you can get it. And you can even extrapolate it to say, well, how much money are we saving directly through this? Um, so that's something that we're working on internally. And intend to share. Um, so next steps for this Insights Accelerator, as we say, gradually working towards productization. But in the meantime, having a few kind of uh, work group sessions with uh, people, organizations who are interested to share with what we've worked on so far and gather feedback about what you'd like to see. And certainly would encourage people to look on the SDL community for news about that. So very quickly wrapping up, we're almost out of time. I think we'll manage a few questions still, uh, but this is just an overview of the upcoming releases. So we've talked about SP1, um, where in addition to what Chip discussed, um, just to mention that we'll support Oxygen 21 and XMetal 14. Um, SP2, document history and in-country reviews, as I said. And then Docs 15, a big one with many of those things that I mentioned. So that new web client working on the REST API, 
the internal ones, but it's making good progress. Um, these AI driven tagging suggestions, and then those crucial kind of knowledge hub features to give you more out of the box capabilities for your, uh, for your online delivery. Okay, so just leave you with some suggested next steps. Certainly talk to your account manager about, about upgrading to these new versions and do join those community discussions. And there are various good demos, Chip's team, the demos they've been doing are posted on the community and many good uh, webinar and live presentation recordings as well. Thanks, Joe. That's really great. We've got a lot of questions here and I think if we don't get all to them, we'll follow up individually with folks. Joe, here's a really good question about how comments and suggestions are stored in the CCMS. Are they mm -hmm. stored at the version metadata level on the topic? And is secondly, is there a reporting UI to resolve the comments? OK. Um, second one first, there is not yet a reporting UI. Um, so the main interface is still review space and draft space. That's something we could be looking at later. But the way it's stored is it's it's pretty pretty much detailed. It's against the publication version, firstly, specifically. So it always knows it was made on that. Clearly, it has the topic GUID as well. Um, and you can also get to what version of the object it was first made on. Plus, uh, you have the information on the latest uh, the latest version that it was viewed in the context of if that makes sense. <laughs> I'm not sure if I explained that right. But there's a lot of data there that we are storing in the in the annotation store. Um, right. That is all available via the, the public API. And I think of importance, Joe, is this is all working off the standard content manager server now, the same APIs and everything. Um, mm -hmm. So it is, uh, it's the list of values that are also used to do some of this configuration, correct? Um, broad, uh, Slightly different bit, but yes, it, it's all what people are familiar with, basically. Right. No surprises there in the terms of the way that, that you work with it. Yes. Yeah. Another good question was, how does draft space work for adding new topics? And uh, it does, earlier in the demo, I showed the ability to insert an existing topic. I can also mm -hmm. insert a new topic and choose from templates. It's a really nice wizard type interface. So if I want to insert a task or a concept, and you can even have um, special templates that you create for SMEs if you have that user role and permission set up. Um, so that's part of our, our deployment best practices um, really well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was really important because clearly it's giving SMEs that power to not only create a new right. version, but a new topic as well. Free and content. Put it in the outline where they want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, another question, Joe, is will the SMEs be notified when changes are implemented? It's a good question. So basically, um, there is uh, what we call an iWrite kind of interface. So you can generate such... Uh, such notifications, it could be an email thing that you've put into place, it does need some implementation work to do that, but the hook is basically there. We can certainly look at doing it on a product later, uh, level later on, but the enabler is there that you can certainly um, do what you want in terms of getting email notifications or something else. Great, thanks, Joe. Another good question, if we're not ready for SME editing, can we implement review space without draft space? Um, the short answer is uh, you do need a few copies of draft space in order to resolve the comments and also actually change the text in the editing. So um, I meant to mention that uh, collective spaces, these licenses are concurrent. So you can share licenses with team or go around the globe and so forth. But yes, you do need at least a few draft space licenses in addition to review space to do the comments and so forth. So, and and I think it's also kind of trying it out and seeing how it feels because I think people will find they they quite like draft space. And clearly the intention is to build it out further, you know, to not rest where we are now, but to gradually introduce more power into draft space. So I think people will find it's a useful tool. And as you say, you know, from a license point of view, that's quite, quite manageable. Right. Um, Joe, there's another a different question about authentication around SAML 2.0. I know you mentioned very briefly around authentication methods. Maybe you want to describe a little bit more what's coming in the future? Oh, 
I, yes. <laughs> I uh, honestly, I, I can talk about this, but I Later have webinar. not prepared. So Later I, webinar. I would say so, yeah, yeah. Great enough. Mm. Well, we are out of time right now, but the rest of you had some great questions. Thank you. We will follow up on email. Uh, Jeffrey, back to you, please. Perfect. Thanks, Chip and Joe, for presenting today. Good, good stuff. And thank you all for attending the webinar. Today's recording will be available here on On24 shortly, but we will also send a copy to everyone who registered. Uh, the recording will also be on our SDL community. We hope you found today's session useful, and we look forward to seeing you again on one of our next webinars. Have a great rest of your day.